Welcome to Christ Church of Fort Thomas, Kentucky. My name is Edward Good, and I am pastor here, and I welcome you. Uh, in, the, in the name of Jesus Christ, on behalf of this wonderful congregation. Our guiding statement as a congregation is that we embrace all as we journey the way of Jesus. So wherever you are in your life journey, your faith journey, we welcome you, we embrace you. We are grateful you're here with us. I do want to just remind you, this will be our last online service or sermon uh, until about middle of November. Uh, I am going on a six-week sabbatical here uh, as part of my uh, uh, terms of call after the last six years of, of service here. I also have another six-week sabbatical uh, in the first part of 2025. Uh, so during that time, we will not be having these services uh, available online, but we will pick them back up in the middle of November. I do also want to remind you that we uh, have an event coming up on October 6th here at Christ Church. It is uh, called Disagreeing Better, and it is led by a nonpartisan organization called Braver Angels, which is really seeking to find ways to help people learn how to talk to one another once again. And so it is a Sunday night, October 6th, from 6 until 7.30. It is free, uh, but you do need to register in advance. And so you'll see the link to that on the screen right now. And so if you are in the area, we encourage you to come and be a part of it. It will be a really powerful, really, uh, I think, important event, uh, not only for us as individuals, but for us as a community of faith, and also for the community members who will, uh, larger community members who will be there as well. So friends, once again, I welcome you, and I look forward to being back with you uh, six weeks from now. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to finish up our series that we've been looking at at that intersection of faith and photography. And so we're going to do that by uh, starting out with words of Scripture from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. We're reading from chapter 12, um, beginning in verse 12 and going through verse 26. So let us pray. Lord our God, take these ancient words and let them be your spirit-spoken words still for us today. Open us to you and to the movement of your spirit. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Now, as I read this passage, I do want you to try to visualize what Paul's talking about here, and I hope you pick up on some of the ridiculous kind of images that Paul gives here. Um, there's some pretty good humor in there if you really kind of stop and listen, and I'll give some pauses as we read. But it begins in verse 12. For just as the body has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Here we're starting to get into some of the ridiculous images, so here we go. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that one wouldn't make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it less, any, any less a part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as God chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, but one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members don't need this. But God so arranged the body, giving greater honor to the inferior member, that there be no dissension in the body. But the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Over the last three weeks, we've been exploring the intersection between the practice of photography and the living of our faith, the, the faith lessons we can learn from this uh, practice. 
And so we've looked at three different things. We've looked at uh, the first week about framing and focus and how we fix our eyes on Jesus is the, the focus of our lives and what is it that we put in the frame, so to speak, of our lives. Second week, we talked about the shutter in the camera, the part of the camera that uh, controls how much light or how long this, the, the image sensor is exposed to the light. And we talked about the passage of time and how we can look back in our lives and see the flow and the movement of God's work in the past. And then last week we talked about the aperture, this circular thing within the lens of a camera that controls how much light comes into the camera. We talked about what is it that we let into our lives? How much stuff are we taking in? And what does that do in terms of the ways in which we live our lives going forward? So in a sense, we talked first week about the present, last week, two weeks ago about the past, then last week about the future. And this week, we're going to try to bring it all together. And we're going to do it starting with this image. This is an image I photographed about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago, something like that. It went in lake near my house. And... I love this bush, or this plant, I don't know, bush, plant, whatever, but it's planted right, and it's growing right along the edge of the water, and it blooms really once a summer. And I just love these big, beautiful white blooms that open up right about sunrise. And it's just this beautiful moment of these blooms opening wide open to, to take in the morning light. It's just beautiful. And in photographing this moment, I had a lot of things I needed to decide, right? How am I going to frame it? Where am I going to put the flower in the image? Do I want it right in the middle? Do I want it off to the side? Do I want to have more of the background in focus or uh, along with the flower? Do I want to have just the flower in focus and the background kind of blurry? All of these questions, right? And the thing is, is in a photograph or in photography, everything affects everything else. You can't just think about the framing and the focus without also the recognition that that's going to affect the shutter and the aperture, and that's going to affect your, your, your choice of film speed, your ISO, and your white balance. All of these things come together to make a single photograph. Now, the good news about most modern cameras is that you don't have to do all of that yourself. So in this case, I decided I wanted to have it framed in this way with the flower over to the side. I wanted to have the background a little more blurry, so I photographed in what's called aperture priority mode. And I set my aperture to a wide open aperture, about 2.5. And then the camera adjusted everything else, but it adjusted the shutter so it didn't overexpose and adjusted the white balance based on where I was focused. And if I changed that, it would affect everything else. Everything affects everything else. And if there's one thing that you remember out of these last few weeks, I want you to remember that. I really do. Everything affects everything else. It's all connected. And I really believe over the last 10 plus years of my life, that is the biggest lesson that God has been teaching me. I shared our first week of this series back on September 8th about my experience in Davidson, North Carolina in November of 2013, where I had this week in the midst of one of the most trying and difficult times of my life, that I had a week that completely changed my life. And, and in that week, as we we're talking about clergy health, <laughs> our personal health and so forth, each day during that week, I met with our group. We met individually with a therapist. We met with an Enneagram coach. We met with a <clears throat> spiritual director. We met with a physical trainer every single day. And multiple days, we also met with a nutritionist. And some days, we met with a financial advisor and some other things that went on throughout the week. The idea being is that our health isn't just one thing. It's all of these things together and how everything affects everything else. The physical trainer, the personal trainer, actually said that I was one of the fittest pastors that she had worked with which was really great to hear. But here's the thing, I wasn't healthy. Yes, I was healthy physically, 
But all the other parts of my, many of those other parts of my life were not healthy, right? Everything affected everything else. And over the last 10 years, I've continued to see this reality in my own life and also in creation around us. I see it in the church. I see it everywhere. And everything is connected. It's all connected. Everything affects everything else. Paul seems to get some of that in this passage from 1 Corinthians. Paul's writing to a group of believers that are divided. They are broken up one against another. They're fighting among each other. They're saying who's more important, who's more spiritual, who's closer to God, who's more worthy. All of this stuff is the things you read about in the first 11 chapters of 1 Corinthians. They're a mess, right? They're unhealthy. But then Paul gets to this place in chapter 12 where Paul gives them this beautiful analogy of the human body, this thing that we each have. And, and he paints this picture for them that in some ways is kind of ridiculous at points. You know, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were, were an ear, where would the sense of smell be, right? They're kind of ridiculous images in a sense. But Paul's point of it is every part is important. Every part is essential to the functioning of the healthy body. And then if one part is suffering, the whole thing suffers. If one part is rejoicing, the whole thing rejoices. It's all connected, is what Paul is lifting up to them. And so when that one part of the body is broken and divided, the whole thing is hurting. Like I said, I've continued to see this in so many places. I do. I see it in the life of the church. That we may be, you know, a church may be really healthy in the ways in which it volunteers and gives of time, but it may not be in the ways that it gives financially. <laughs> or it may be really amazing in its worship life and community life, but it isn't doing anything in terms of how to grow as disciples. It may be really great at kind of spiritually feeding itself, but it may not be a community that is reaching out beyond the walls. All of it is essential. Everything's connected. I see it in creation. The small example, unfortunately, it's kind of a negative example, but um, this past Tuesday, at our Lunch and Learn, we had folks from Raptors, Inc. who were here, a, a raptor rescue organization. They brought these three beautiful owls. They talked about, though, how barn owls are really starting to disappear in our country because their habitat's being taken away, but also because they're getting unhealthy food. One of their primary uh, sources of food are mice. And what's happening is people don't like mice in their house, so they put out uh, mouse or rat poison, the mouse eats that and maybe gets out of the house before it dies. And as it's weakened, the owl sees it and swoops up, eats it up. And all of a sudden now the owl gets sick because it ate the rat that ate the poison that was put out there because we didn't want a mouse in our house. It's all connected. I read this book a few weeks ago called The Light Eaters that paints this amazing picture of what science is finding about the intelligence of plant life and, and how plant life is connected to itself and connected to us in ways that science is just now getting the tiniest glimpses. It's amazing and incredible and beautiful. It's all connected. That is so essential for us. In a country and in a world that does focus on individualism and separateness, the gospel message is a different one that says, no, we're not all separate, pe separate beings. We are part one with another. There's a beautiful man named Thomas Merton. He was a monk in Kentucky at the Gethsemane Abbey near Louisville. And he wrote about this revelatory moment that he had in the most common of places. He writes this, 
In Louisville, at the corner of 4th and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all these people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation in a special world. And then it was as if I suddenly saw the secret beauty of their hearts, the depths of their hearts where neither sin nor desire nor self-knowledge can reach, the core of the reality, the re person that each one is in God's eyes. <sighs> if only we could see each other like that all the time. <sighs> My friends, we are in a divisive time right now. And this is a place that the gospel can speak a different word, an encouraging word and a challenging word. We are all connected. I am yours and you are mine. You are a child of God. I am a child of God. And so one of the practices I'm going to be trying during my sabbatical coming up is to try to look at every person, at every person, and look at them and see you are a child of God. Maybe I say it to myself. Maybe I'll say it to them as a reminder that whether I like them or I don't, whether I know them or I don't, I am a part of them and they of me. It's all connected. Everything affects everything else. I know about you, but that gives me hope. May it be the same for you. Grace, peace, love, and joy be with you today and every day. And I'll see you in November.